Welcome to the Kerry Newhoff Leadership Podcast on YouTube. I hope this episode helps you break your next growth barrier. And if you enjoy it, subscribe to my YouTube channel and you'll never miss a thing. Well, whether it's staffing, budget, volunteers, or one of the many other things that hold church leaders back, overcoming growth barriers is the key to progress. So if you're ready to break your next barrier, the Art of Leadership Academy might be exactly right for you. Inside the Academy, you'll get access to on-demand church leadership courses, team trainings and coaching calls with me. But more importantly, you're gonna join a network of over 1,500 high capacity church leaders. Some will be exactly where you're at, some a little bit ahead, but everybody in the group is committed to leading a healthier, growing church and supporting each other. So if you wanna fuel your mission, not just by consuming more information, but by being in a community with people who will challenge and support you, then today's your day. Learn more and start making progress by visiting theartofleadershipacademy.com. And now to today's episode. Bill, welcome to the podcast. Really glad to have you here. Great to be here with you. Yeah. So you cut your teeth working in advertising and you had, have had major clients like American Express, Dodge, uh, Kohler, Five Hour Energy, Taco Bell, the illustrious Taco Bell. Uh, can you yeah. tell us about, I'm <laughs> laughing because it's made an appearance a couple times on this podcast. I had Carlos Whitaker on um, probably recently. No, actually, you might be on before, Carlos. <laughs> uh, you ever heard about the $20 challenge for no. Taco Bell? You have no. to go to Taco Bell and eat $20 worth of food. And... Oh. Uh, yeah, it, it doesn't go well. Let's put it that way. We'll save that for Carlos. Yeah, this I, I always, you know, and people don't like it when I say this either, but people, I, I always say I worked on Kohler and Taco Bell and I was actually trying to get them to work together because it seems like they do work together quite well. <laughs> <laughs> That's, funny. That's really good. Uh, can you tell us about what makes iconic brands like that? Because you got to admit, Taco Bell's done really well, even, you know, in American uh, Express, Dodge, et cetera. What, what is it about those brands that have become iconic? And think outside your portfolio too, you know, Nike, et cetera, yeah. uh, Adidas. What makes them effective at getting to the forefront of the collective mind? Yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a mentality when it comes to being a big brand. You know, I mean, and, you know, number one is they believe in branding, right? And they, and they invest in it. And they, they don't see it as an expense. They see it as an investment, almost like an investment in their stock portfolio. And they expect an ROI and they expect it to grow, right? I always say that people and companies like the, like the brands that we all know, the, the Apple computers, the Nikes and stuff like that, they don't see themselves as companies anymore. They see themselves as brands. And, and that's because the brand is the most important thing that they have. They know that they could actually change their business tomorrow and still carry that brand forward with them. And they would have credibility because they're, they're a known brand. Like IBM, for example, when I was a kid, IBM made computers. Today, they don't even make computers, right? They're, yeah. they're, yeah. A, they're a technology consulting company. They've completely changed their, their, their brand. Matter of fact, when I first got to know IBM, they knew they made copier machines. I mean, that's what they were really good at. And, <laughs> But they recognize that they built a brand, right? And they built a reputation. And so they can, they can leverage and move that wherever they want. And that's what's beautiful about building a brand is it is an investment in something that you can move and leverage in a lot of different places and spaces. And so number one thing is they, these companies and these organizations, they believe in becoming a brand. And so they're very serious about that. So they see themselves as a brand, not as a company. But then beyond that, though, they, when it comes to messaging, they understand the importance of simplicity. And I, I always tell people, and especially like when I work with churches and nonprofit organizations, I, I ask them, I say, are you more sophisticated and complicated than Apple, Nike, and Harley Davidson? And usually you can get most organizations to say, no, those are big companies with lots of employees and factories and retail operations and, you know, uh, and, and so they, they can they can admit to themselves that it doesn't they're not as complicated and sophisticated as those brands. And I go, great, because they got their brands down to three words, two words and one word. Or a symbol. And, yeah. Yeah. So just do it is Nike. Um, think different is Apple. And then freedom is what Harley Davidson is about. And people always say freedom. 
And I, and I say, yeah, because they're smart enough to know that they give license to people to be something different than they normally are. They Normally during the day, they're an accountant or an attorney or a doctor. But on the weekend, if they put on a bandana and a Harley shirt and ride around on a Harley Davidson, suddenly there's somebody completely different, right? So they give them the freedom to be that, that crazy bad person that they either desire to be or used to be, you know, and most of the time it's right. desire to be, <laughs> right? You know, uh, and it's just, they want freedom from, you know, the workplace. They want freedom from who they are during the week. And so Harley Davidson gives them that freedom to be something different than they normally are. And that's why people buy into the Harley brand. It's also why people tattoo the Harley brand. <laughs> it's the only only brand I know of that people actually put the tattoo on on their uh, on their bodies, right? You know? Mm-hmm. And so that's the first challenge is to really get people to say simplicity is really, really important, right? But then beyond that too, it's really about, you know, positioning, positioning yourself as something different than what's in the marketplace. And I always tell organizations that marketing, for example, is actually not about throwing a bunch of messages to the marketplace. It's about frequently, over and over again, driving a point home that makes you really different. And I use Geico as an example of that. Since 1994, they basically have said the same thing over and over and over again. You know, give us 15 minutes and we'll save you 15% or more on car insurance, right? You know, and now it's boat insurance and home insurance and motorcycle insurance, right? But it's that we'll save you 15% or more. And they've repeated the same thing since 1994. They just find different ways to say it and entertaining ways to say it. But they spend $2 billion a year saying it. <laughs> and, and and so when you look at kind of like you take branding and uh, uh, uh and, it's, and, and say, that's an investment and it's, it's a worthwhile investment because we'll, we'll get a return on that. And then you say, we have to be really simple. We have to say something that's really unique. And then we have to say it frequently. Um, hmm. You know, those are the things that make big brands, big brands. And that's part of, you know, when I look at the He Gets Us campaign, as we get into that, it's a lot of that thinking, quite honestly, that we brought into that campaign. Mm-hmm. And I think that that really helps understand it. Before we get there, I want to break down what you said about yeah. branding as an investment, not an expense. Maybe I've yeah. just been around too many leadership tables in the church world and nonprofit world. There's always the bean counter who's like, first thing we cut is the advertising budget, right? right. It's just an expense. Which should be the last I mean, thing you cut, quite honestly. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So let's let's have that discussion. Um, talk about it as an investment and why it would be, because you're right. I mean, I don't think in we are sort of moving through this weird economic time right now. I don't think Apple's like, cut all the ads. We're just not going to do it. Nike's like, pull all the endorsements, right? They're not doing that. No. And the reason no. is, especially when you talk about nonprofit organizations and faith-based organizations, you kind of have to get them to think differently, <laughs> you know, not to, not to mm-hmm. borrow Apple, but no, you, know, you have to get you them to, to say, you know, what is your job as a nonprofit organization? What is your do- job as a church? Right. And mm-hmm. a lot of people in the nonprofit world will say, well, you know, you know, our, our job is to educate people, you know, uh, about the homeless or to feed the hungry. Right. And I would say that's, that's, that's your driving purpose. Right. Mm-hmm. But your real purpose is you're a conduit to create awareness about a problem and to raise the support needed to help that problem. So your number one job actually is fundraising and marketing. (laughs) (laughs) Right. That's a total paradigm. Having sat on the board of nonprofits, total paradigm. I have to tell causes all the time. You're not the cause. You exist to raise support and awareness about the cause and then to get the resources together to actually help people, right? And so your number one job is actually to get the message out. You're just a conduit for those resources and those funds to get to where they're needed. But your number one job is fundraising and getting the support because without the support, you don't, you're not helping the cause, right? How does that message go over? When you share it with, with non I, I, always, I, always, I, always, I use Peter Drucker a lot. And if you're familiar with uh-huh. Peter Drucker, he had a very famous quote about business where he, where he told business leaders, 
a business has one and only one purpose, and that is to create a customer. If you can't create a customer, I don't care what your showrooms look like. I don't care what your products look like. I don't care what your prices are. If they can't create a customer, you don't have a sustainable business, right? right. Years later, right. Right. years later, Peter Drucker wrote a book on nonprofit management, and he told nonprofit executives, a nonprofit organization only has one and only one purpose, and that is to create a supporter. You can tell me all day long that you have all these other concerns and, and, and issues. The reality is, is your job is to raise the money and support needed to help that cause. And so, and as a result, you know, he said marketing and innovation and communications are the most important things a nonprofit organization can do. And I would argue a church could do, right? I mean, even Jesus said, go spread the good news, right? Right. Right. Evangelism. I, you know, I argue that evangelism is just a really nice word for marketing. <laughs> <laughs> and so if you really look at the Christian message, that's what we're, that's what we're called to do. Right. So I can see people already pulling out my email address to start emailing <laughs> me or leave a comment going, hold up, hold up, Bill. Hold the on, church is not a business. The church is not a business. All right. What do you, what do you, and, and I think they have a point. To be fair, of course it's not. We're not out to you know to retain earnings or report to shareholders. We're mission driven in the whole deal, and yet I would be on the well. We can learn a lot from the business world, and you know I, I led a church under my leadership to three or four thousand people who called it home. Man, I'll tell you, principle one: if you're not organized, you're toast. Like if right. you don't have systems, if you don't have processes, if you don't have uh, a way to deliver. Even, you know, a relationship with Christ in a way with that many people, you're, you're done for. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not playing devil's advocate here. I'm just acknowledging that a lot of people would say, we're shepherds, we're not CEOs, etc. So what, what do you say when someone comes up with that kind of objection? Yeah, I, I, I would say, you, you could call it that, but I would say we're in God's business, right? Mm. And, you know, yes, we don't have a product to sell and we don't have a profit to make. Um, but we, we do have something to sell and it is life saving. And, and, and as a result, you know, I have no problem with people looking at a church or a ministry as we're in the business of doing what we need to do. And we're going to take it as seriously as a business person who's trying to make money. We're going to, we're going to take soul saving as important as, as, as important as making money. In fact, it's more important. So as a result, yeah. there has to be a, I, I look at business not as a, an opposite of ministry. I look at, as, look at business as a way in which you approach things and the seriousness in which you approach things. And I, I look at ministry as the most important business in the world. And, and I say, again, you know, I can look at it and say, hey, is the stock market more important than soul saving? No, it's not. Mm-hmm. And so we need to approach it that way. I know Franklin Graham, for example, I know there's a story about him and I think in the book Rebel with a Cause where Billy Graham, his father, ends up kind of disappointed that he's not going to go to seminary school, that he's going to go to business school, right? Mm -hmm. And he tells, his, he tells his dad, he says, hey, dad, I, you know, I, I grew up with you. I mean, that's like going to seminary, right? You know, what I, yeah. yeah. I want to do is I see what who's capturing the hearts and minds of people in this country. And it happens to be business people are really successful at this. Matter of fact, I would say that they're more successful right now in our culture than churches and ministry. I mean, they, they get us to shop and buy things at a level that the churches have not even been able to get people to buy into their message at the same level and with the same kind of emotion and excitement about it. So he tells his dad, I'm going to go to business school because I'm going to do God's business. Hmm. Hmm. I want to approach my ministry as serious as any business person approaches their business. It's just, you can get caught up in the semantics and the words and label one good and one, one bad. But the reality is, is business is not a bad term. And especially when you're talking about God's business. Well, you know, it's interesting, you know, the body of Christ. I mean, that the, you go back to the Latin, it's corpse, right? Yeah. Uh, corporation. That's where you get it from. It's a body, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So interesting, interesting things. All right. Let's, uh, what are some mistakes you see churches making in marketing? Oh, what are, what are churches making? Well, you know, they, they avoid the, they don't do the, the uh, simplicity and the frequency and that they also don't focus on the emotion 
of, of what the churches, uh, you know, should be doing. Uh, but they also, you know, I, I, you know, one thing that drives me crazy about churches is they seem to kind of like borrow from secular, the secular world themes, like, you know, the whole, I saw for years, you know, got Jesus, you know, and uh, instead yeah, of got, yeah, Coke, got right? Coke. you know, and, and number one is, you know, that's illegal. You're stealing somebody's intellectual mm-hmm. property, you know, but number two, it's very unoriginal. And, yeah. and people then start to look at the church as unoriginal people and people that need to borrow from the business world because they don't have credibility themselves. And so, you know, that unoriginality and that inability to really kind of say, hey, our business is about, you know, capturing people's souls, about bringing people to Jesus and saving them, right? Why would we not take this any any, any more seriously than just borrowing somebody else's tagline? And so, but you got to take churches back to that that idea that says, you know, how do we do this best? How do the people do it best? You know, I mean, if you're training to, you know, be a great musician or a great athlete, I mean, you look at, regardless of where the person's faith background is, you look at the people and you say, how do I do that best? What do they do to become really good at what they, what they're doing? And so if you're going to communicate, why just look to the Christian world and, and say, that's my level from which I'm going to communicate. We always challenge our, our, clients that I work with in the ministry world to be able to say, no, look at what the secular world is doing and saying, maybe we're not going to be able to outspend them, but we certainly can outsmart them. And one of the ways we can outsmart them is use the same things that they're using that are already successful. You know, but I would argue that a lot of what, of, of what even the corporate world um, understands about marketing, Jesus already taught us. You know, I would say that Jesus was the perfect communicator, right? I mean, he always started you know, when he talked to people, he started with people and their situation and their condition. What are they dealing with, right? And then he would tell them stories. And, you know, uh, people have told me that 30% of everything that Jesus said in the Bible was either a powerful story or a parable, right? And so he used stories to bring them along to teach them what he wanted them to do and what, what did he wanted them to understand. And then from that point, though, you know, he did a storytelling in such a way that he led people to an answer. He didn't always tell them the answer, right? He he allowed them to participate in the process. But then he also was very smart in that he would tell his stories. He would tell farmer stories to farmers, like he'd, he'd tell agricultural stories to, to farmers. He would tell athletic stories to athletes. You know, he would tell soldier stories to soldiers. He would tell building stories to builders, right? He crafted his messages to that person's interests and what they would understand, right? So you listen to what I've just said. He started with them, not what he wanted to sell them. He craft. He told them stories that made their imagination follow them, and made made what he was saying more memorable. You know, because it was a story that, that they could embody and 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 then retell themselves. Right. He led them to a conclusion. He didn't tell them what the conclusion was. Oftentimes, so they felt they were a part of the process. And he told them stories that resonated with them, that they were interested in. Yeah. Once I learned that. I was like, why did I go to marketing school? I could have just studied what Jesus did. He was the master storyteller. I feel like we're getting the secret sauce behind he gets us in mm. what you just said over the last 90 seconds. Now, I, I, I want to hang on to that thought and come back to it later because I want to dig down a little bit more. You know, you said something that honestly I've never thought of and have been guilty of at times. But you're right. I think the church does a lot of derivative marketing. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we might we might have a sermon series called Just Do It or something like that, which you pointed out is illegal. Um, I understand why people do it, but, you know, that's TM'd or whatever, or it's a registered trademark. Um, talk about why that is uninspiring and uh, probably we could do better. Can you can you yeah. talk? Because you you're right. You don't see you don't see uh, Apple copying Dell. You don't see that ripping off some slogan and then passing it off as their marketing. But churches do this all the time. So let's go there. Right. I mean, number one, it's not intelligent, right? I mean, it's just not. You know, there's a basic you know saying. 
are you that dumb to just steal somebody else's thing, right? You know, I mean, are you that <laughs> unoriginal, right? And so it just, uh, you know, so you just look at it and you go, that's just, you know, that's just poor taste, right? You know, but then, the, but beyond that, though, I mean, it's just, you know, it's not different. It's not unique. People like to hear different. They like to hear unique. They like to hear fresh. They are, you know, it's what the market really is constantly about is bringing fresh ideas and unique ideas and different ideas. And I, I coach people all the time on, on branding and marketing. And I say, different is better than better. Hmm. And people don't understand that until you start saying, you know, why people are really successful. I mean, there's so many different pizza restaurants, for example, right? And you go, yeah. Why does the world need so many different pizza restaurants? But every one of them, you know, the ones that are really successful, can tell you why they're different. Mm-hmm. And they make that difference compelling enough where you go, I, I want that, right? And I'm willing to go farther or pay more for that because I believe in that difference, right? And so if you're not, if you're telling unoriginal stories and you're just borrowing from other people's stories, you're not really really looking at what the market responds to and the market responds to new, fresh, different kind of thinking. And so you, you know, you have to constantly be reinventing how you tell the story because this, otherwise they're going to feel like they've heard that story before and they don't want to hear it again. Right. I mean, I talked to several pastors about the, he gets his campaign and one pastor in particular, a leading pastor said, you know, what I love about, he gets us just the words he gets us is we've all heard Jesus loves you, right? And many people have heard that a gazillion times, right? And he gets us, still says Jesus loves you, but it says it in such a way that it's new and fresh and actually appeals to a different emotional level with people. So like if I, like if I say I love you, you know, let's go, okay, you love me. Thank you. So Thank I, you. I, really, I really get you and that's why I love you. That means I've gone to another level in my relationship with you saying, I get you. I understand what motivates you. And and as a result of that, I love you and I like you. Right. Mm -hmm. And so he gets us speaks to people at a, you know, at a different level that they, that they haven't been spoken to where they haven't really thought about, well, yeah, I I know Jesus loves me, but you know, does he really like me? You got to like somebody to want to get them. And, uh, and so I thought that was a great insight from that pastor to say, you're just saying Jesus loves you, but you're saying it in a new and a fresh and a relevant way. And it also has a deeper connection with people that maybe they've experienced before. So I could go in two directions now. I'm going to let you yeah. pick. Okay. I was okay. Uh, on the one hand, I'm like, okay, so you head into a church basement or an elder board to do some marketing. Where do you start? That's option A. Option B is I was, and this is why you're on the show, really blown away by the marketing under He Gets Us because I'd heard about it through mutual friends and one of our, you know, He Gets Us has become one of our partners. And to be honest, when I first heard about it, I thought, oh, this will be like every other Christian ad I've ever seen and it'll be all right, but it won't be great. Then I watched the first ad and I'm like, oh boy, this is different, like good, excellent, memorable, completely different. And now we're going to the Super Bowl with, with, you know, the, he gets us, that, which is insane. insane. I remember when I first heard about that, you know, behind the scenes with some of my contacts, I'm like, are you kidding me? Um, but it's one of those, those, those moments where I'm, I'm actually very excited about it. So the other, the other option is you can take us through the design of the, he gets us campaign, the behind the scenes. So either way, whether you're starting from scratch with a new church or nonprofit, or if you want to take us, because I really feel like it's a fret, like, you know, I've lived a few years. I've never seen a Christian ad campaign like that. And it's really moved me. I mean, I was sitting in a room in Dallas with you at the end of 2022, and we're watching some of the ads coming out ahead of time. And like, most of us are in tears. Yeah. And you could have heard a pin drop. That's not usually what happens in Christian fair. So, you know, either take us through the anatomy of he gets us and how you built that from the ground up, what the principles underneath that. What was yeah, the I think that would be process? helpful for people. You to want to do that? Okay, let's yeah. do that because you know yeah. you 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 sat down with this idea, 
right. that, okay, there were some investors, some kingdom minded people that wanted to fund something that would make people think twice about Jesus. I don't know. Take us back to that point. Yeah. I, and and I, I know the exact day. I know the exact time. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it was March 4th, 2021. And, uh, and I, I get a call from, uh, a person that is a business leader and an investor uh, in in the gospel, and and he's leading a coalition of people that want to do something different, right, and unique. As a matter of fact, I got the text from him saying, "Hey, do you have time to talk? I got a really big idea I want to talk to you about." And uh, I actually I had to put him off to like five o'clock Eastern time, you know. Which, you know <laughs> it's the, like I'm I go, so my, busy. My day's really full, you know, but you know, yeah, <laughs> I yeah. don't want to miss this call, right? And so, you know, he calls me, and, and you know. What I love about where this started is, and, and, and I coach people all the time, sometimes a great campaign or a great message that you want to send to the marketplace doesn't start with a great idea. Mm. It starts with a great problem statement. Oh, I love that. Right? And yeah. so, so, he, so he, tell, he tells me right up front, he, go, he, goes, he goes, we want to do a campaign. And I'm like, well, all right, campaign about what? You know? And he, go, he goes, I want to do this campaign that, you know, we want to do this campaign that solves this problem statement where there's this problem we've got going on in America. You know, it isn't just people not going to church and stuff like that. It's just this problem that, that we've come across is, and it's, it's on our hearts is how did the greatest love story, how did the world's greatest love story in Jesus become known as a hate group? How did that happen? And he, and he actually led me to some websites that, um, different organizations had out there that were identifying different Christian organizations as hate groups. And why they were classified as hate groups is because of their stance on abortion or their stance on same-sex mm-hmm. marriage, right? You know, which is a religious stance, but it has been interpreted as being hate speech. And matter of fact, one of the groups is the Southern Poverty Law Center, which I think in the past has done really some really phenomenal work in terms of racism and things like that. But they actually have a hate map and it, and it lists Christian identity as right with the KKK and, and uh, you know, and white supremacists as hate groups. And this is hate speech. And the problem with that is the Southern Poverty Law Center is who the New York Times, the Washington Post, Facebook, Instagram, every major university in this country, a lot of government agencies look to as they're the people who are going to identify who is a hate group and who is spewing out he hate speech, right? And so you look at just some basic Christian virtues that we have and, and basic Christian beliefs being now articulated to everybody who's controlling really the voice just talking to America and saying, these people are, this is a hate group, right? And so it's like, yeah, how do we- To be fair, I mean, some of us have behaved that way, you know, <laughs> definitely there, but I get the heart behind it, but I'm like, yeah, some of us are guilty as charged. And yet that is not the Christian story. Yeah. A lot of it's self-inflicted wounds. I mean, there's no question about it. Right. You know, and, and people have not handled those subjects as well as they could in the past. Right. So, you know, why, why it hurt is because it hurt me as a Christian. You know, when he first said that problem statement, it was like, man, that hurts. You know, we all get hard with the same brush. We all get Right. We all because it's like, that's not Jesus at all. I know that's no, not Jesus at all. Certainly it's like, not Jesus. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I also know that we've contributed to that, but you know, that's where it kind of goes. Eh, so what, what are we going to do? How are we going to change, you know, this trajectory? Right. And so, you know, that's where it started. And, and I said, I just said, you know, okay, so we'll do this campaign, but um, we got to do this the right way. We got to do this like no other campaign has been done before. I mean, you guys are serious about wanting to get behind this. And they were putting serious money behind this. And I said, if you're going to invest that kind of time and that kind of capital, it's let's do this the right way. And so I literally went back to my experiences with American Express and Dodge and Taco Bell and say, how do the biggest and best brands in the world take their message to the marketplace? Right. And so I said, right from the get go, I said, I said, we are going to, number one, we're going to do our research. We're going to do our homework, right? And we're going to get insights from people, uh, especially the people that we're trying to target. 
And then we're also going to test messaging with them. And we're going to find out there are a lot of different ways to say what we want to say, but what are the most compelling and motivating ways for us to communicate what it is it that we want to say? And we're going to test that and we're going to perfect that. Then we're going to put that into a strategy and direction. And quite honestly, you know, I've, I've created an acronym for this process. It's called the ideas process, because that's what we're supposed to do is we, we come up with ideas, right? But, you know, there's, this process is not unique to the ideas process. That's just an acronym that's easy for people to remember, right? So the first you thing you want to do. The I, yeah. 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 I the I is the insights. Let's get insights. And then we move to the D, which is based on those insights, let's develop some strategies and D direction. Hmm. Right. Let's, you know, I mean, it, everything's a risk, right? And you just have to, you have to say, okay, what strategy are we going to take? What direction are we going to take? What target audiences are we going to go after? What are we going to say to them based on what our research and our findings said? And we're going to develop a strategy document that really outlines what is our main message? What are our support messages? What are our reasons to believe? And who are we going to target? And why are they going to believe it? And then how are we going to appeal to them emotionally, right? The thing about really smart marketers is they don't try to reason you into buying into what they want you to believe. They talk to your emotions, right? And if you talk to most marketers and most market research, they will tell you emotion is 80% of the reason why you choose to buy something or buy into something, right? Reason is only like 20%. And it's got more so. It yeah, backfills your decision, right? It's yeah, like, oh yeah, right. I bought that because. <laughs> right, exactly. And a lot of times it's just like, you know, I, I, I bought Crest toothpaste. Why? Because my dad bought Crest toothpaste. I mean, that's an emotion, right? It's like something you grew up with, right? Or it's made in a certain city and I'm, I'm dedicated to that city, you know? Or, I mean, there's all kinds of reasons why people buy or buy into something, but 80% of the time it's emotionally based. And so you have, you can't ignore the fact that there's emotion has to play a role in the messages that you want to bring to the marketplace. And that's why, you know, early on, we, we found that felt needs were really important ways for, to get people to listen, right? So the felt needs of, you know, you're struggling financially. Guess what? Jesus did too. He gets that, right? You're, 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 you're struggling with stress and anxiety. Guess what? Jesus had to face that too, he gets you as a result of that, right? You know, you don't feel welcome all the time, especially when you walk into a church or when you're around other Christians, right? Jesus didn't feel uh, welcomed all the time around religious people either, you know? And so he, he gets you, right? So, you know, what was interesting too is we found out that, you know, not all that long ago, the top felt needs for people were somewhere in the, rela like something to do with relationships, usually divorce and stuff like that, or addiction. So if you were to talk about the top felt needs that would drive people to maybe seek Jesus or talk to a Christian or go to a church or go to a ministry program, it usually had something to do with a relationship, you know, in terms of like, especially like divorce or something to do with addiction, you know, or dependency. Since COVID though, things have really changed. And the top two things why people that they're, mo that they're most concerned about is actually toxic relationships, like hmm. toxic relationships related to politics, toxic relationships at work with people arguing, toxic relationships with my family. We don't even get together at Thanksgiving and Christmas anymore because we can't stand to be around each other because all we do is argue, right? Like we have a commercial out right now that says family matters, you know? And, you know, and it talks about, you know, it goes through the trajectory of, we started out together young and together and we did a lot of things together. We really enjoyed each other. And as we got older, you know, our ideas separated ourselves. And then we started to argue with each other. And pretty soon we didn't want to be around each other anymore. You can't tell, I can't tell you how many people have wrote into us and said, it's like, you know, my family, that's what has happened. So toxic relationships is number one in America. It's become the number one concern among people, right? And the felt need. And number two is anxiety. Right. 
So people are dealing with a lot of mental health issues, right? And a lot of it probably has to do with all the toxic toxicity that's going on in America right now and people just arguing over just really dumb stuff, you know, that don't that doesn't really matter. And and so knowing those felt needs, we said we're going to develop a, we're going to go after a target audience and we're going to be talking about the felt needs and how Jesus understood and understands those felt needs, right? Mm-hmm. He lived them himself, right? You know, he's fully human and fully God, right? But the human side of him he got exposed to the same things that we get exposed to all the time. And he had to work his way through it and understand it and help us understand it as a result. He felt what we felt. And so therefore he could talk to us about the way we were feeling because he had a, he, he, he developed an understanding with his time with us, right? And so we developed a, dire- a direction and strategy based on that. And then we brought it to the E in ideas is his, his expression. Hmm. And expression is, I'm a big believer in exploring a lot of ways to express the idea. Like they're all like when we handed out our creative brief to, to start discovering how to express this brand, right. And how, how to express this to the marketplace, everybody worked from the exact same brief. Everybody worked from the exact same. This is the main message. These are the support points. These are some of the emotions that we can tap into, right? Everybody worked from the same brief. But I said, we are going to, this is the way major brands do it. We're going to have a lot of people think about this. And they're all going to have different takes on this. There's a lot of different ways we can be funny. We can be irreverent. We can make people angry. You know, we can make people cry. There's a lot of different ways we can approach our voice to the marketplace. And what is our voice going to be? So what I did is I actually threw it out to five national secular agencies some of the best of the country, people working with major brands. And I remember I got, I got questioned by the supporters of this campaign going, where are you going to find these people at secular agencies? I got, I already know them. They're Christians. They work in secular agencies, right? And they would love to do this, right? And we were, they were as surprised as anybody that when we started asking these people who do major brand work, who are already talking to culture, when you ask them, would you do this campaign with us? You can't believe how many of them cried and said, mm-hmm. I've been dreaming about being able to do something like this. Mm-hmm. Right. I even had a guy, I had a, I had a guy that, you know, he, he works with Nike. He works with the NBA. He works with Gatorade, right? He works with major brands and he, he's in Los Angeles. And I told him, I, you know, I got to have you pitch this because I, I promised that we would have a lot of different ideas come to the table. And ultimately he didn't win, you know, and unfortunately he's a friend of mine, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, but, you know, he even told us, he said, he said, he, he had us on the edge of our seat when he said, he said, Hey, what you guys don't understand is I don't pitch anything. <laughs> I never pitch anything in my career. He said, when, if Nike wants to work with me, they work with me because of my reputation. If the NBA wants to work with me, the NBA works with me because of my reputation. They don't ask me to pitch. He says, well, I haven't pitched anything in 30 years. And everybody was kind of on the edge of their seat going, Bill, I thought you said everybody was going to be willing to pitch, right? <laughs> but he gave, he gave us that moment of silence and then he got the biggest grin. And he said, but this one's for Jesus. I'm going to pitch. Right. <laughs> and, and so, so, so we got collectively, we got 15 different campaigns that we considered and they went in all different directions. And some we felt were, you know, too, too close to what Christian messages would be like. And other ones were way <laughs> too far away. Right. And, uh, and, but I, but we knew, and I, I had coached our, our consideration team and, and, I, and the committee that we pulled together for this. I said, I'm looking for the next just do it. I'm looking for that hook that you can put against any message. You can make me laugh. You can make me cry. You can make me do anything. But you're going to remember some simple phrase at the end. So when we saw it, he gets us and it was presented to us by an agency out of Dallas, all of us just looked at each other and said, Bill, you said you want to just do it. He gets us is pretty darn close to that. And, uh, and that's, that's, you know, so, but we explored a lot of different expressions. That's very important, right? Not just to do one idea, two ideas, explore a lot of different ways to express yourself and find out which one really works. Hmm. And then action plan is the A, right? 
take it to action. How are we going to take it to action? It's going to require lots of different media and a lot of different places for it to play. If you really look at how big brands do things, they just don't play in one media. They put together an integrated campaign. It includes influencers. It includes social media strategies. It includes paid media strategies. It includes TV, billboard, being in sports arenas. They just want to be everywhere where the target audience is at because that familiarity, once people get going and start understanding, they go, well, this brand must be cool because it's everywhere, right? And, and as a result of just getting to that point and saying, you know, this brand is pretty cool. It's got a pretty good attitude. I like, I like what, you know, I've never seen a Jesus campaign like this before, you know? Then after a while, it's like, I'm, I'm going to start watching more of those, right? I actually had one of my own relatives who I've been trying to convert to Christianity for 40 years, <laughs> right? And we've every, you know, we're the reason why sometimes we don't want to get together at Christmas because this person and I will argue every Christmas, right? You know? <laughs> yeah. and, and, and this person actually was a, actually over the years has been, you know, expressed their disappointment that I would raise my kids as Christians, you know, and I would talk about Jesus. Like, why don't you just let them grow up and decide what they're going to do, right? I mean, this is the kind, kind of relationship I've had with this person, right? And so this Christmas, I see that person and that person says to me, hey, Bill, and he gets this campaign. I'm like, oh, I'm about ready to, you know, I don't want to get in an argument with this person, right? Yeah. And that person says to me, I really like it. I go, you do? And they go, yeah. And they said, you know, I don't know if I should tell you this or not, but I think it's a fairly woke campaign. I go, <laughs> I go, I, I go, you do? I go, I go, why do you think it's woke? I, and, uh, and the person says back to me, I mean, I guess I never really understood how woke Jesus is, you know, that he cared for the poor, he cared for the marginalized, right? And that, you know, he cared about the same things that I care about, right? You know, he didn't really like religious people. He really didn't like politics. He really, you know, he really stood up for some really good things. And I'm like, so you like the campaign and you're finding Jesus more acceptable. Yeah. Matter of fact, I, I, I started reading the Bible plans that are on there. You know, I guess I've never really understood Jesus before. And I've only heard him preach to me. I haven't really explored him for myself. And then we got done with that conversation. I go, well, I just, you know, that's great. If, it, you know, I just want to, I want you to continue to explore. And I, I hope, I hope, you know, it has an impact on you. And the person said to me, yeah, I, I, you know, I'm going to continue to explore more. Thank you. And uh, afterwards, my wife heard the whole conversation and she said, I was just so surprised that you didn't come back to that person and fight the fact that it's not a woke campaign. Hmm. And it, when we were, when we were introducing this campaign, we, had, um, one of the people that we stopped and talked to was Rick Warren. Mm -hmm. And Rick Warren said to me, which I think is just a really great um, insight. He said, what I love about the He Gets His campaign is we all know there's only one way to God, Right through Jesus, but there are thousands of ways to Jesus. And so I tell my wife, I said, I go went back to that Rick Warren quote at that moment. And I said, if her way to Jesus, if this person's way to Jesus is that she thinks Jesus is woke, I don't really care as long as she finds <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> yeah. right? And everybody's going to relate to Jesus differently. I relate to Jesus differently all the time, right? I probably, you know, I probably put more business stuff on him than anybody that I know, right? You know, but I don't think he was a business guy either. But right, that's, how right. I can kind of, that's how I can relate to him, right? I put a lot of leadership stuff on Jesus. I don't exactly. think he was a leadership guy. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And so that action is taking it to market and then about measuring success. And we're constantly. Can I, can I just ask you one or two questions to, yeah. to before we get to, to uh, yeah. measuring success? Did, did that relative know that you were behind? He gets us. Yes. Yeah. And actually, okay, that's great, I, great. Yeah. Yeah. And that, and sh that person knew I was behind it and that would make that person more skeptical of it because she's been very skeptical. She's like, it. ugh. But actually, yeah. it's good. Okay, yeah. no, that's super helpful. Yeah, there the goes other thing Bill, I just one of those Jesus campaigns, right? You know? yeah. and, uh, but this yeah. one, you know, and, and I've heard this again and again. Um, this person described it to me where I'm watching a football game or I'm watching a show and this ad comes on that I can't quite figure out. 
but it's beautiful. Mm-hmm. And the storytelling is so excellent. And the cinematography is so great. And the music is just so great that I just, I get drawn into the message. And then I get to the end and I go, oh my gosh, I just watched a Jesus commercial, right? And, and Chris Como actually, you know, Chris Como who left CNN and has his own show, he did an interview with us and I thought it was going to be a hostile interview. And it was not a hostile interview at all. He said, hey, I just got to, I got to admit, I'm sitting there watching a football game and this commercial comes on and I get drawn in. And I'm like, man, this is like one of the most interesting commercials I've ever seen. And then he gets to the end. He goes, oh my gosh, I just watched a Jesus commercial. And I liked it. (laughs) You know, he said, and I liked it. Right. And so, and then, you know, during our interview with him, he says, he says, you know, he started exploring with us, you know, why are we doing this and what's behind it? And, you know, he had some hard questions, but they weren't that hard to answer. And then he gets to the end of the interview and he says, well, all I could tell you is you got me. <laughs> and he said, wow. God bless you. He said, God bless you at the end of the interview. Right. And I'm like, I'm looking at, I'm looking at this stuff. And I'm going, this is just it's so wonderful to see all these people who would, who would, I think would be not so willing to watch a Jesus commercial, <laughs> watch a Jesus commercial and get to the end and go, wow, that was a great message. I really like that. Yeah. The other thing I, I just want to close the curiosity loop on, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but you mentioned the donor and the phone call that kicked it all off. Uh, yeah. That donor wishes to remain anonymous in the group behind it too, correct? Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of donors, right? And that, that donor in particular. And they want to remain anonymous. Yeah. And the, the beautiful thing is, is and I, well, the reason they want to remain anonymous is a lot to do with anybody who has the resources that they have to be able to put behind this has a history, right? And they, they may have stood for things and stood behind things that, that people who are spiritually open but skeptical of Christians may not agree with, right? So they're, they're saying, we don't want what we've stood for and what we've done to impact this campaign at all. So the reason they want to be anonymous is they just don't want this campaign focused on anything else other than Jesus. And so they just, they want to stay out of the, out of the limelight and not take any credit for this. They should, I mean, I mean, without their vision, without their problem statement, without their support, without their willingness to take the risks that they're taking, this campaign wouldn't exist. I mean, Bill McHenry does not have the money, you know, that, that Mm -hmm. to, to put behind this, right. Or the resources behind this. And, and nor do I, you know, I have to be honest. I mean, these people have extremely thick skin. Right. You know, in the sense that, you know, any criticism we get and stuff like that, they go, well, they just don't understand us right now. They, they will over time, you know, where I'm just kind of like, I kind of want to fight back on everything. And I'm like, I've, I've learned quite honestly, just personally, I've learned in doing this campaign, something about myself. It's like, I got, I learned to stop arguing and start advocating. Why don't you just, why don't you get to know Jesus? Like you just tell the person, you know what, you need to get to know Jesus and then you got to work that out with him. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not going to tell you my opinion on things. Why don't you find out Jesus's opinion on this stuff and then work it out with him? There's a lot of, I mean, we live in such a moment in our culture where almost everybody is too left wing or too right wing or too centrist or too non-committal or too outspoken or too this. And I would just say, just to, cause I, I always have, why didn't he ask that question as an interviewer? It's like, yeah. There's a lot of very quiet, anonymous donor work happening in the kingdom right now, particularly in North America. And it's beautiful to see. Really. When you meet some of the people involved, it's like, wow, these are people who could be building monuments to themselves. And they're not. They're not. So anyway, that closes that loop. Let's talk about measuring. So yeah, so, so the last and the last step in the ideas process is constantly, you know, you have to measure success. So you have to know what your measurements are going in. But mm-hmm. then you have to then you have to say to yourself, but what a, what a, what what the, what the, what's going to define success? And interestingly enough, we started out this campaign, and we had very typical measures of success. You know, very campaign oriented measures of success: how many clicks, how many likes, how many visits, how many views on YouTube, so on and so on and so on. And uh, we actually established for year one. Uh, I remember <laughs> saying this; it just seems so ridiculous now, right? I remember saying in year one. We're going for four and a half million actions. 
right? Hmm. And, 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 and what is an action? An action is I like a share, a video right. view, right? Kind of you response. Know, four, yeah. yeah, four and a half million. And, and it turned out to be a percentage of the target audience that we we're going after. It was actually 30% of the target audience that we were trying to go after. And uh, initially, we've expanded but our who's audience. Your target? Who's, who's your target? Uh, 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 spiritually open skeptics. Got it. All right. Okay. So I was looking for four and a half million actions. And I remember even being asked by the donors, wow, that seems like a lot. You know, do you think we're going to be able to achieve that? You know, is that kind of a stretch goal for you, Bill? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, it is a stretch goal. I don't know if we can do that, but it's pretty, I think we should aim for that. I think it's doable with the money that you're spending. There's no reason why we shouldn't be able to get there. Um, and so let's just set that up. And everybody's like, all right, let's, let's go with that. We hit four and a half million actions in the first three weeks of the campaign. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Right. And, and, you know, before 12 weeks was over, you know, I mean, we we're approaching 30, 40 million views of just on YouTube, right? Now, it, it, right now, I think we're, we're 500, over 500 million views of our video right now, videos, right? And, and so every metric that we tried to establish up front, we have completely blown out of the water. And, and, and so it left us, you know, saying, well, we could get together every week and we could talk about, wow, we keep blowing these metrics out of the water, but maybe we need new metrics. And so we went back and we said, you know, really this campaign is about changing attitudes and behaviors. So what can we find out from our, from our attitude and behavior research? What do we have a potential of changing in people's hearts? And so we created new KPIs, you know, key performance indicators, right? And, you know, things like if you're a spiritually open skeptic and you get exposed to our campaign, are you more likely to see Jesus as a worthy example to follow? Are you, uh, do, do you, do you see Jesus? Like before you saw our campaign and now you see our campaign, do you think Jesus actually gets you? Not just us, but gets you, right? And are you more likely to want to read the Bible about and learn more about Jesus, you know? So these are, these are some major KPIs that we're measuring against and their attitude and and behavior changes. And I, and and I can tell you after just like the first 12 weeks, we did our first major measure measurement and we had double digit growth in every single KPI that we put out there. Right. And so, you know, when people are saying, you know, are you moving people toward Christ? It doesn't, you know, you know, it's like, yeah, this is a this is a long journey for these people. These people are pretty far away from Christ right now. And so, you know, it, we have to be patient and we have to be moving them along over time. But yes, our measurements clearly indicate double digit growth in major KPIs on attitude and behavior of people. Like they're willing to look at Jesus differently, look at Jesus as a relationship that's different for them. And they're also willing to now start to explore when previously they weren't willing to explore. Hmm. That's so encouraging. And then, you know, there's also the connection with local churches too and with counselors. And like if somebody raises their hand and says, yeah, I want to know more. Like there's a, there's a follow-up on that too. Yeah. And and that's, I think that's the easiest because I, I would, I would have, I would argue that some of our harshest criticism actually comes from the Christian ecosystem rather than oh, really? our secular really? audience, yeah. right? And, and I don't <laughs> yeah. mind that, right? I mean, it's yeah. iron sharpening iron. We got, we, we've got to be that way. And, and the biggest concern I would tell you that people have is like, you seem to be focusing only on the humanity of Jesus, not the divinity of Jesus. And we say, right, because these people aren't ready for that, right? We've done, we've done our research. And hmm. we, the first thing that we need to do is raise the respect and relevancy of Jesus so they want to explore him more. And when they go to explore him more, they're going to find out he wasn't just a good guy, a good teacher. He said he was God, right? And so you're going to have, they're going to have to deal with that. But they're not going to deal with that through a 30 and 60 second ad. I'm sorry. It's just not going to happen. Our goal is to create a giant on-ramp for people to want to explore more about Jesus and to lead people to all kinds of resources to explore more about Jesus, right? So we're off-ramping people into alpha. We're off-ramping people into churches. We're off-ramping people into um, um, uh, ministries, 
I, I was just told this last week. We've had a 4,000 people who have, were on the brink of suicide through He Gets Us, right? Right? So we're, we're off-ramping those people into places where they need, need to go, right? Mm-hmm. I, I've been challenged by uh, many um, ministries and, and pastors saying, well, when are you going to talk to them about repent? When are you going to talk to them about, you know, that they're sinners and they need to change? And I'm going, I'm not. You are. We're going to lead them to you. That's the whole idea here. And why would you start there? You don't start you know, there. That's my it, question. It's like, why yeah. would you start there? It's like, yeah. It was actually yeah. David, I don't know if you're familiar with David French, and he did, he did an interview with us, and, and he actually noticed a pattern in our storytelling, and he said, you know, what I love about the pattern of your of the He Gets a Storytelling is you're actually modeling the, the, the pattern of storytelling within the Bible. Mm-hmm. And he said, you, the Bible always usually starts with everybody, with their biography. They let you know who that person is, where they came from, what they're facing, right? And then and then he said, and then you're introduced to that person's theology. What do they stand for? What do they stand against? And then you get to the person's morality. What won't they do? What are the non-negotiables, right? He said, unfortunately, churches want you to start with morality. And he said, but mm-hmm, mm-hmm. he gets us, it's really smart because you're you're teaching people Jesus' biography, where he came from and who he is and you know what he had to face. And then you're teaching him some of his theology, some of the things that he held dear and that were really important to him. And and then now you're off ramping them into all kinds of ministries and churches and programs where people can now start to move these people further. We're not going to do that in an ad campaign. Nobody t- nobody tries to sell you a car without ever, well, some people are trying to do that today, but trying to sell you a car without ever taking a test ride, you know, mm-hmm. and, 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 and or walking into a dealership. I mean, eventually you have to have a conversation with somebody to advance your beliefs. And an, and an ad campaign can only do so much. An ad campaign can lead you to those resources, create an interest to get you to want to go, maybe I should explore that, right? To create awareness in your heart to say, there's something missing in my life. Maybe it's because I don't have Jesus in my life, right? And so it's about, an ad campaign can do those kind of things. It can't bring people all the way through the journey by itself. And to, and so that's, a, that's part of the, the, the hardest challenge I think that we've had is getting people to understand that we're about putting as many people as we possibly can on the journey journey to get to know Christ. Hmm. So I want to go back a little bit, and I don't want you to throw some of the pitches under the bus, but if we can go back to the 15 or so pitches that you got I can almost imagine sitting around a table and coming up with a bad idea for you. Like church is not as bad as you think, or, you know, it could be, could be that kind of approach. What were, what were some approaches that you're like, yeah, this would be predictable for the church, but we're not going to go down that road just to get us thinking because, and then I want to, yeah, yeah. you you kind of look back. Make some up in your head, make some up in your head if you don't want to. Yeah. Some of the ideas were, you know, um, Jesus did this, even though Christians do that, right? Well, and one thing, oh, yeah. you know, yeah, you know, right? And and to the target audience, that actually would have been very impactful, right? Mm. It's you know, bad Christians, you know, good Jesus, good Jesus. You know, <laughs> right? You know, it's the Christians yeah. that are bad, and uh, you know, I mean, somebody quoted to me the quote, quote where Gandhi said, you know, I, I I like your Christ, I don't like your Christians, right? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. and and that's how a lot of skeptics feel. Our research found that is actually seventy five, mm-hmm. no, eighty five percent of people in our survey. This is a national survey, you know, of basically everybody in America, every belief system and everything. Eighty five percent of people in America actually respect Jesus, whether they believe in him as 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 mm-hmm. as, as the Son of God. That's a whole different story. But they at least have a fundamental. I respect Jesus, right? So the the brand of Jesus was in no trouble. It's just they don't they don't have any depth in their understanding, and that's what we wanted to bring to them, right? And so there were a lot of campaigns that were that were brought to us like bad Christian, good Jesus. We're like, we're not going to do that. We're not going to throw Christians under the bus, you know? Yes, Christians have made some mistakes, but we're not going to throw them under the bus. And there was actually some campaigns that try to politicize things, you know? It's like. How have certain groups been treated by Christians? That's, you know, that's wrong. Jesus would never do that, 
right? And it's like, we're not going to do that. I mean, the number one thing that we're, you know, we don't, we don't want the church or Christians to be thrown under the bus just for the sake of gaining market share, right? Well, and then where and, do you send people to these yeah, bad Yeah, where do you send people? And it's a good question. Right. Yeah, not every church is a great option, you know, and yet you have to trust that somehow God is at work. And as someone who led a church for two decades, I'm sure there were times where my leadership was not very healthy and God still brought people to Christ and other times where it was healthier. But yeah, that, that, that's really good. Okay. What, could you imagine? Well, I, also, I, other- I'm just, I would add to that too. Our, our basic strategy uh, message is uh, we wanted to position Jesus as the most radical activist in the history of the world. Right. So whatever you think of Nelson Mandela or Mother Teresa or even Gandhi or Martin Luther King, take all those people and whatever you love about them, Jesus is all of them on steroids and many more, many of them pattern their life after him. Right. Sure. And, sure. And, and so that's, so as a result of that input that we gave to the, all the creatives, and that was based on on the research that we did. That was that was a message that people resonated with. It's like, I, I guess I never really thought of Jesus as this radical activist for people, you know, and uh, and he was. He stood up for the marginalized. He, you know, he stood up for the poor. He didn't. He stood up for the people that were being attacked by their and persecuted by their governments or even by religious leaders, right? And so there's a lot of things when you think about the spiritually open skeptic that made a lot of sense for them to to view him as an activist, right, and pretty radical. Right. And almost confounding in his love and forgiveness and grace. And, and, and so that positioning really worked. But then there were creative campaigns that said, okay, basically turned him into a superhero. Right. You know, it's like, or a, well, you felt like he was a superhero or a magician. Right. You know, it's like, nah, we don't want to go down that path. Right. You know, we want, we got, we need it. And what I love about, I think ultimately what I love about that he gets this campaign, it's the, it's the right amount of emotion and a right amount of kind of like seriousness. There's always a level of seriousness. And we have fun once in a while. I mean, we have, you know, we have, especially when we're in baseball stadiums and football stadiums, you know, we, we have some fun with some lines like Jesus forgave errors too in baseball stadiums, you know, and, <laughs> you know, and, you know, Jesus, Jesus, did, you know, he believed all the way right up until two outs from the bottom of the ninth, you know, he just believed right to the end, right? You know, and, uh, <laughs> and so we, we have some fun with it. And we even have, there's an ad that's a very popular ad that, you know, Jesus let his hair down too, right? You know, when you think about the wedding and stuff like that, you know, and we want to constantly remind people that Christianity is about joy too. But we also want, there has to be a level of seriousness that we're going about this and we just, and, and emotion. So it's a level of seriousness and emotion and just finding that right balance in that message and bringing it to market. That we that really kind of drew us to the he gets us campaign. Plus the you just uh, like the he gets us man. It's just like so easy to remember. How do you evoke emotion? Because for those, I'm I mean I'm sure there's a few people who haven't seen the ads, but I mean they're available. We'll link to them in the show notes. Mostly black and white, although you ventured yeah. into color a little bit more recently. Some still some motion very gritty images. Uh, talk about that interplay of, you know, what you see, what you hear, what you feel in 30 seconds, 60 seconds, and how that can do so much in a human heart. Cause I felt it too. Yeah. We, and they've been very smart. You know, number one, you know, words say, or pictures say way more than words. And so, and you know, video, and we, we've relied very heavily on almost photojournalistic photography. And when you see great photojournalistic photography, especially in black and white, and it's, you strip away all the color and you can just see the emotion that's going on there. There's, some, there's a depth and richness about that art form that we found very appealing, right? And using stills more than videos. Now, we've, we've resorted to a few videos, like on Family Matters, because it was about family videos. And so we said, okay, we, you know, it's tough, tough to capture family moments and family videos and stills. We wanted it to be very authentic to what we were trying to capture. But, you know, the black and white uh, cinematic type of and journalistic type photography just says something to people. And it's also different than what you normally see. I mean, you know, and, and especially like we're going to be going into Super Bowl soon. And I mean, you know, a lot of ads have a lot of hype and a lot of celebrities and a lot of color and they're throwing a lot at you. And we said, let's just 
zig where everybody else is zagging and let's go slow. Let's move slow. Let's use stills. Let's, you know, let's use a photojournalistic style. Let's use a style that isn't glamorous and attractive. Maybe there's some really disturbing and hurtful and maybe even ugly things that are happening in front of you. It's like, why would anybody even advertise this? Nobody advertises this kind of stuff, right? And so it's about really capturing people visually. We're very smart in the words that we use. We use very, very, very few words, right? And we usually, we don't read the end ink to anybody. We make them read it themselves. It comes up, you know, without any voiceover, right? And that's uh, because- Why do you do that? Why do you do that? It's a little bit like what I told you, how Jesus' storytelling was, letting people come to the conclusion themselves, when they read it for themselves and we don't read it to them, it becomes a part of them, right? It's like, I just took that in. I had to read it. I had to understand it for myself. And that that process of understanding it for yourself, we feel is, number one, if you're going to follow a master storyteller, might as well follow Jesus, right? <laughs> right? He allowed people to take it in. He allowed people to come to the conclusion themselves and read it and understand it for themselves. And that's what, that's what we do there. So we've been very, but the, you know, there's also music that drives people through this. That's very powerful music that, that we're, what we're using and original and scores. So, what's that? Original scores, original stories, you know, the scores, uh, scores, like, oh, are you scoring no, they're not. the music? No, they're, and most of the time no. they're, they're, no, it's, it's music that, and more and more we're, you know, we tried very hard to get, more and more popular music as, oh, as we're kind of moving okay. along because we want people to kind of like resonate with, whoa, what's that? Right. You know, and we, we have, we have uh, two tracks on the Super Bowl ads that people are just, one's very nostalgic, but everybody's going to know who it is. And, okay. and one's, one's, one's pretty contemporary and it's an international, it's been an international hit, but it's very soulful and moving. Right. And so people are going to go, part of the psyche is, wow. You know, for the spiritually open skeptics, like, man, that was pretty cool music that they had. Mm. And that was a Jesus ad. It was cool cinematography and it was cool music. And man, that had a great ending to it, you know? And so there's just a, there's a, I guess, a understated cool factor about everything that we're trying to do where people kind of go to it, kind of like Chris Como said, he says, like, I watched an ad and I liked it and it was a Jesus ad. And I had to admit to myself, I liked it. You know, it's like my relative. It's like, I've been watching these Jesus ads. I like them. You know, I can't deny that I, that I like them. The level of storytelling is powerful, but it's also unique. You know, it's unique in the marketplace. It just stands out. So we're doing everything that says, let's send signals to the marketplace. That this is like, this is an ad like you've never seen before. So let's talk, and I know there are limits. I'm learning along the way of what you can yeah. say and not say about the Super Bowl, one of our partners is working very closely with it. So, yeah. and again, I think this is good learning because uh, the majority of people who will listen to this episode will probably hear it after Super Bowl, what is right. it, 57? Uh, is it 57 this year? I'm such a sports guy. Anyway, yeah. 2023, right. Yeah, eventually. Um, but I mean, you know, if you had a, a Super Bowl ad five years ago, it's still a big deal. So do you want to talk about some of the, elements that are unique to Super Bowl ads and how you prep for them and what you hope to accomplish because it is not cheap airtime. And it's not I cheap. mean, the ads are as big as a the game. They really are. So, yeah. and, and they're reviewed like the game is reviewed, right? So can you talk about the prep for the Super Bowl? Yeah. I mean, you know, the Super Bowl is a big event. I mean, it's, uh, yeah. you know, over 115 million people in this country will be watching it. Somebody, uh, told me the other day, 90% of the televisions that evening will be tuned to the Super Bowl, right? So I've done national surveys with Harris Polls over the years and ask people, do you watch the game? Do you watch the Super Bowl for the game or the ads? Right? 65% hmm. of people watch as much for the ads as the game. And when you talk to women especially, I mean, it, it indexes like, you know, indexes like 70, 80% of women watch for the ads. And so you're not going to, you know, people, people ask me all the, people ask me all the time. It's like, is the Super Bowl worth the investment? And I, and I tell them, if you have the budget, yes, it is. Because on a cost per thousand basis, 
you'll never find a better media buy. Never. Mm. 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 So, the, so when you think about the metrics of the Super Bowl, the number of people yeah. watching, but also they're watching for the ads where most every other TV show in the, uh, that you can watch, everybody's trying to avoid the ads, right? So, so you have the world's attention and especially in this country, you have this country's attention. Um, and so, so preparing for the Super Bowl requires that you know the moment you're getting into and realize that what you're competing with and you're competing with the world's best brands and the world's best storytellers at this medium. This medium is for advertising people is the Oscar awards. That is. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so, yeah. so you have to make sure number one, is your story Oscar worthy? And we have, we have gone through so many different ideas to say, is that really Super Bowl worthy? You know, even in the end, even the music that we're using, and even in the photos that we're using, is that Super Bowl worthy? And that's, you know, that, that's a part of it. But also a part of it is, what do you do before and after the game? You know, because it is expensive, but you have to be able to say, how are we going to leverage this moment? We're not going to leverage this moment just in the, in the time that we have in the Super Bowl. It's the lead up to the Super Bowl. And it's the post of the Super Bowl. And what are we putting around that, right? We're actually going to do a teaser campaign before the Super Bowl. And then we're going to have, a, you know, people are going to understand that teaser campaign after the Super Bowl, right? We're gathering influencers and we're asking them, can you wear He Gets Us stuff? Can you talk about He Gets Us? Can you get your people behind it? And kind of the theme line, and we're working with churches and we're working with pastors and we're working with authors. And we're, we're actually challenging people especially in churches and pastors and Christians all over the country. You can, and people can actually go to hegetsuspartners.com, which is a website that not a lot of people know about, and they can actually sign up to support our effort in the Super Bowl. And what we're asking people is understand that we're welcoming Jesus to the Super Bowl for the first time. And what people don't really realize is the NFL had a ban on, a, on religious advertising. Yeah, this is an interesting story. Can you say more about that? Because this was really, yeah. I heard the backstory and one of the reasons I wanted to have you on. So tell us about that. Yeah. And so the NFL had a ban on religious advertising. We actually approached them last summer and we said, we want to advertise on your games, but you guys have a ban on religious advertising and we want to be in the Super Bowl. But you guys have a religious, you have a ban on religious advertising. And the only two things that they banned, you know, for a long time was gambling and religious advertising. Now the only thing that they ban is religious advertising. Fortunately, though, at the end of 2021, we actually tested this campaign in 10 markets. And it just so happened that some of the markets that we tested it in were NFL markets. And we would buy local television. We wouldn't have to buy national television. So we didn't need to get NFL approval. But if you're going to advertise nationally, you have to get NFL approval. And oh, so, so you're market, sponsoring local games? like Yeah. We, no, when we were, we were buying the NFL game through the local TV station NBC that broadcasts it. Yeah, yeah, the local yeah. ABC affiliate or the local Fox affiliate, right? And you can do that. And the NFL doesn't try to stop that but they'll stop it if you want to advertise nationally, right? Interestingly enough, some of the owners, so some of the cities were Kansas City, Charlotte, Dallas, where we tested it. So when we brought, when it was brought to the NFL owners, it was actually the owners of those teams. They didn't know that we weren't advertising nationally. They saw it on their TVs and just assumed huh, I thought we had a ban on religious advertising. You know, nobody talked to us about it. But then when it was brought to the NFL owners, it was actually the owners within those markets that told the other owners, have you seen these ads? And, they're, and the other owners are like, no. And those owners actually went to our YouTube page and played the ads for the NFL owners. And they all looked at each other and they said, wow, those are really good ads. 
<laughs> and they're not really asking for anything. They're not asking people to give any money. They're not telling people to go to a specific church or believe, you know, in a specific denomination. You know, they're really not even asking people to do anything other than, hey, look at what Jesus said about this. And they go, we think this country could use more of that. Hmm. And so the owners unanimously voted to allow us to advertise. And so they changed their policy in, in the NFL. And their new policy is they don't have a ban on religious advertising, but they're going to approve them on a case-by-case -case basis. And they told us, but everything's got to be as good as he gets us. Otherwise, it ain't getting through. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. So, yeah. you know, again, I don't want to spoil the surprise, but uh, how did you go? Because the, the campaign's already pretty good. And, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm not somebody who thinks Christian media is great. In fact, I often avoid it because it's not great to be totally transparent. Uh, I love that he gets us ads. So how do you go from what you've been doing to Super Bowl? Like, how big is that gap and what do you need to do to yeah, close and we, it? And we developed, we, we decided in September, September, uh, before September, but we, we started to establish a theme. And so every, every so often we would have a theme uh, for that period of time. And, and it wasn't dedicated to like six weeks, we're going to do this six weeks. We're going to go that we just quite honestly, we looked at, at kind of the, the rhythm of the calendar, right. And the things that we all go through, right. And you kind of like, you look at fall and fall is kind of like, you know, a new season and, you know, new challenges and stuff like that. And so we kind of focused, you know, around, you know, let, you know, as we head into fall, maybe we can just be more unified in love, right? And so our theme was unified in love. Our Christmas theme was, you know, just building on the Christmas theme. We're actually now in a different theme right now where we're saying, you know, new resolutions, right? You know, you can actually make a new resolution. You can actually change. You can actually be a different person. People decide to do that every year, right? And so... You know, so you think about forgiveness and grace and saying, you know, that naturally fits into the rhythm of the new year and saying, you know, you can be born again now. You can be a different person than you've been in the past, right? And understand that, right? You know, we don't say born again and, you know, we don't use religious terms, but we allow, we give people the understanding that you can change and this is a season of change. And, you know, you, and so our, our, our themes have been around that. For the Super Bowl, we chose the theme of the third way. Hmm. And the third way for us is we have been so divided in this country, right, left, red, blue, conservative, liberal. You, you choose the side and, you know, people just defend their side to no end. And it's gotten ugly, right? Really ugly. And so our commercials are going to be around that topic for you. And, it, and one is going to surprise people because it's so heartwarming. Right. As a matter of fact, that's, we, we have, we have two ads. We're going to have a 30 second ad and we're going to have a 60 second ad. The first ad is going to be the heartwarming ad and it's going to run between the first and the second quarter in the Super Bowl. And people who haven't heard of us before or people who have heard of us before are going to get to the end of that ad. And I'm pretty sure everybody's going to go, I like those he gets us people. That was a really, really nice ad. And then when it gets to the second half, that's when the tougher ad comes up. And then we're going to really challenge people in the second half with a 60 second ad. That's really going to challenge people. And it's going to challenge Christians as much as it's going to challenge non-Christians. Kind of sounds like what Jesus did, though. Nobody, Absolutely. you know, my Absolutely. my debate in the Gospels is, I don't know that I'm on the side of the people Jesus was with or whether I'm a Pharisee. It always makes me uncomfortable. Exactly. And Jesus hmm. did that to people often. You know, at first you find yourself oh, yeah. head nodding yeah. and agreeing with them. Yeah, yeah. I, I, oh, but then I got to make this choice. <laughs> I know. Welcome oh, to my dang, life, man. Welcome yeah. to my life, man. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Well, I can't wait to see them. Um, yeah. All right. Let's let's bring this down to earth. Uh, okay. So most most ninety nine point nine 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 percent of our listeners don't have 
$10 million, $100 million to spend on an ad campaign, uh, lots of money to spend on Super Bowl ads. They maybe have a small investment in marketing, if anything. But again, a lot of it is about the idea, right? And your social is free. So you can do a bad job on your social. You can do a good job on your social. What are some principles for churches with, let's say, you know, a startup church, church plant, or a small nonprofit? They don't even have a seven-figure budget. Um, maybe they have 100000 or something. Total budget. That's for everything to keep the lights on. What are some marketing principles that work at that scale? Yeah, and, and you know, one of my favorite topics on when I when I try to coach people on this is <clears throat> everybody assumes branding and marketing is all about advertising, and it's not right. right? And uh, I, I think we could both agree that Howard Schultz uh, from Starbucks has built one of the world's biggest brands, right? Oh, everybody kind of oh, knows what Starbucks time. is, yeah. right? Yeah. <clears throat> Starbucks, interestingly enough, even though Howard Schultz is an advertising guy. Mm-hmm. He barely ever advertises. Yeah, you're right. Starbucks doesn't advertise. And I actually saw an interview with him where he said, it, it was an, actually, I think it was in Business Week magazine or Wall Street Journal. I can't remember. But he was asked that question. He goes, they said, you know, you built one of the world's greatest brands, but you barely ever advertise. And you're an advertising guy. That's what you used to do. That's kind of strange. And he said, well, if you think branding and marketing is just about advertising, then then you don't really understand branding at all. Hmm. And they said, well, explain it to me. And he said, branding and marketing is realizing everything matters. Every single touch point matters. He says, why do you think, you know, our logo and our cups are cool? Why do you think our stores are cool? Why do you think the music in our stores are cool? Why do you think the packaging on everything that has a Starbucks logo on it is cool? Why do you think we call our people baristas instead of sales associates? Why, you know, mm-hmm. why do you think we make the decisions to be where we're where we're at location-wise? Right? He said every one of those is, is a messaging decision. This location over that location is a message. This packaging over that packaging is a message. This music over that music is a message. And he said, a cup is like a billboard. A location is like a TV ad. So what he, what I coach people all the time is saying, manage every single one of your touch points to the best it can possibly be. I challenge nonprofit organizations today. I go, Today, you can leave here. You can be a better brander of marketing by looking at your lobby yeah, yeah, and yeah. deciding how you, how you receive people. Look at how people, when they visit you, how are they treated when they come through your door? When you leave voicemails or send emails, what does that sound like and look like? And what does it feel like, right? How do your people dress? What titles do they have? These are a lot of things. You're sending signals. You're sending branding signals to people all the time. You just think it's operations. But in reality, you're sending messages to people all the time. So you want to, first thing that I would tell a small church and organization is manage every single touch point to the best it possibly can be. But you need to even backtrack from that a little bit. And you need to ask yourself, what is the message that we want to send? Are we friendly? Are we approachable? Are we compassionate? What are the things that we're trying to send to the world, right? When we did our research, we found out that what people really want in a good person, what they, what they self-identified as, as a good person is that a good person is a peacekeeper, is compassionate, is approachable, and loves all. And then we went back in our research, and these people did not know this was a Christian research, right? That we were doing Christian research. And we asked them, we actually compared all the religious figures throughout history, Abraham, Buddha, Muhammad, and we even did Gandhi. We even did Martin Luther King, right? And then we also did Jesus. Do you know there was only one religious leader in history 
that matched up exactly with what people said was a good person? Hmm. Jesus, right? You know, when I, and when I saw that, I, I said, Lord, you just, man, you know this stuff, but, and you told us this stuff that, that you're on everybody's heart, whether they want to deny it or accept it. And then when we ask them, what is a good person? The model for a good person is Jesus, whether they want to admit it or not, right? And so does a church want to be more compassionate? Does a church want to be more, see, be seen as more passionate to people, right? Do they want to see as being seen as more approachable? Take a niche and own it, right? And make sure it's like, how do we receive people more compassionately? How do we seem more approachable when we talk, when we give sermons, when we give handouts, when we're out in the community? What is the value that we most want to convey to people? And then own it. Own it at every single brand contact. And so you have to simplify to a main message, and then you have to exemplify it in everything that you're doing. One of my favorite stories, quite honestly, is there's, there's a... In, in all of branding and marketing is there's a, there's a firm out of Chicago that, that actually is the leading marketing strategy firm for every, for retailers worldwide. And they actually work with competitors. And I'm like, how do you do that? Cause I can't work. Like if I work on one company's marketing, I can't work on their competitors marketing. So can't I was like, yeah. Empty at the same time. yeah, you can't do that. Right. But they do. Right. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, how do you do that? And they go, because of our method is not duplicatable by your competitor. Hmm. So what they, they force all of their clients when they're, when they're telling them to develop a strategy of how they're going to go to market, they tell them you can have an EST and one only. And everybody, everybody always says, well, they assume EST is some kind of acronym. So, you know, what's an EST? And they go, it's a word that ends with EST. You, you can only own one word as a retailer. Hmm. And so I, so, I, so I immediately brought it to their clients and thinking about their clients. And they actually worked with Walmart and Target. Okay, yeah. Right? And so I said to them, let's use them as an example. You give me, you know, what was their EST? And they said, well, you probably can guess Walmart's. It's pretty easy to guess. And I go, what is it? Lowest. I was going to say lowest, lowest price, low. right? And so we told Walmart, whatever you do in your advertising, whatever you do in your store signs, whatever you do in your stores, whatever you say about yourself on social media, keep reinforcing you're the lowest price. Nobody can beat you at that. That's what you're good at. You need to own that in everything, every contact that you have. And I'm like, all right, so now I'm interested. What's targets? I'm having a harder time guessing targets. Yeah. And what target ended up saying, well, we can't be lowest price because we know we, you know, we can't beat Walmart. Their scale is way bigger than ours, right? And their buying power is incredible. And so they said, we can't own that. So we have to own something else. And they landed on, Coolest. Mm. They didn't have to be cooler than everybody. They just had to be cooler than Walmart, right? And so when you think about Target and the experience Target, you know, from their shopping baskets to the graphics in their stores to their own brands that they re- that they package and stuff like that, everything's cooler at Target. Mm-hmm. It really is, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. You know, and I, I said, how far did they take You know, I'm talking about brand contacts, right? How far do they want to own coolest? Give me an example of just like the most minor detail that you can think of. And they, they wanted to be, they wanted to be cooler and they go, Oh, that's really easy. Cause one day they called us, you know, the, 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 the the strategy firm and they said, Hey, can you guys find out what kind of floor cleaner Walmart uses? And the strategy firm said, yeah, we probably can figure that out for you, you know? Why? And Target said, because we're cooler than Walmart. We don't want to smell anything like them. <laughs> we want to smell cooler, right? And I remember, I remember, you know, I saw a meme not too long ago that kind of exemplified that. And it was during like COVID when, yeah. you know, it was hard, hard, hard to find things. And a, and a guy had posted, 
on his on his meme on his social media feed. He says, he says, I hate it when Walmart doesn't have what I want. Cause then I gotta go home, I gotta get out of my pajamas, I gotta take a shower and shave, and then get dressed up and go to Target. He's <laughs> in his mind, he knows cool people go to Target. You can't just go there in your PJs unshaved, you know? You got to get like, get ready to go to a Target because they're cooler. Where Walmart, <laughs> you know, you just walk in there in your PJs, it doesn't really matter, right? Uh -huh, but it tells nobody you, noticed. Yeah, you can tell from that story, though, that's true. People really mm -hmm. believe Target is cool and they believe Walmart is lowest price. It really depends on what you're looking for, right? So again, you, you exemplify that, you own that position and you keep owning that position in every single touch point all the way down to your floor cleaner, if you can. Is there, and this may be a no, and then we can just wrap up, but is there a set of questions or uh, an exercise? Because I'm thinking of the small startup organization. You look at the vast majority of businesses, vast majority of churches, sub $1 million budget, not huge enterprises. But even, you know, as they're sitting down the DIY option, is there a series of questions they could start with or an exercise they could go through that's widely available or anything like that? Does that exist? Or I'm just curious. Well, I, I, you tell me if I can do this or not. <laughs> okay, okay, you can do it. <laughs> There's this book called Do More Good. Ah, uh, there you by go. Guy, Bill McKendry. <laughs> uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. And inside of here, I actually wrote this book exactly for the people that you're talking about. I took all the big brand stuff. principles and said, "Here's the ideas process, and here's how you can work it for you." Right. So, but the, I would tell you that the most I, I, the the thing where I start with a lot of people though is with that problem statement. What's the problem statement that you're trying to overcome? Gosh, that is so helpful. So that right. saved my life last year. As we right. were renewing the vision of the company, I'm like, I don't have a problem I'm waking up, a clearly defined problem I'm waking up trying to solve every day or that our company is trying to solve and found the problem and the vision followed right after that. That's so important. Right. Yeah, so yeah. you look at that problem statement, then you, then you say, okay, so I, ha I have... Uh, I have clients work through, you know, so what's our history with that problem, right? You know, what are we known for in that area? And then, you know, how do we approach that? What is it that we do to help solve that problem? And then how do people experience that mm -hmm. through our organization? And then what's the ultimate benefit I get by working with your organization instead of somebody else? And that leads you then to the center of, of, the, of I call those that cornerstones. It leads you to the center of right. what promise do we want to make to the market? And, but a promise is shallow if you can't deliver. So you got to make sure if I'm going to make this promise to the marketplace, I got to deliver it. So when Walmart says we're the lowest price, you, they, they better deliver that every day. And if Target says they're the coolest, they better deliver that every day. Because if you can't, like uh, Southwest Airlines recently ran into a big problem, right? They oh, couldn't yeah, get yeah. people where they needed to not go. good to them. Uh -huh. Right? You know, and, and I dug up an qu old quote from one of the original founders of Southwest Airlines, and he said, we're not going to be defeated by our, our competition. The enemy is us. The only people that are going to defeat us is us. And that's what happened that day. You know, you can love your customers all day long and tell them that you love them and love them and love them. But if you don't get them to see their loved ones, and they want to get there, and you leave them stranded in airports without really any answers, that doesn't go with the brand. So you you know you can't make this promise and not deliver. So the book, by the way, is called "Do More Good: Moving Nonprofits from Good to Growth." It is a huge investment, uh, very close to the Super Bowl, seventeen dollars and twenty nine cents <laughs> right now at Amazon.com. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that tucks into most budgets. So we'll link to that in the show notes too. $17.29, not a bad investment in not a bad your investment future. At all. And that's no. for the hardcover version of it too. So that's it. You can you can probably, if you do some, what is it? Yeah, Kindle's $13.99 and the audiobook is free or use up one of your credits. So there you go. Exactly. Bill, this has been great. Anything we didn't cover that you'd like to touch on before we wrap up? I think we covered a lot. <laughs> we did. We did. We sure did. We went over time. I would just go, I would go back to the point of, you know, start with that fundamental um, concept that 
marketing yourself and communicating about your organization is an investment, not an expense. <clears throat> and you, you should expect a return on investment. And if you're not getting one, it's not because marketing and doesn't work. It's just you're not doing the right marketing, right? You got to figure that out. You're either not talking to the right audience, or you don't have the right message, or you don't have the right frequency, but marketing works. And that's why, go back to Super Bowl, you know, I always get asked every year, you know, because, you know, because of we've done polls and stuff like that. Um, I get asked by major media all the time. It's like, is the Super Bowl worth it? Yes, it is. Mm-hmm. Right? Because the people who are advertising in the Super Bowl are expecting a return on investment. And one of my favorite stories is, uh, you know, about Super Bowl was uh, Five Hour Energy. The first time I went to go visit them, right? They were a client for a while. Sitting in their lobby, they have no artwork in their lobby. But they have an article from USA Today, and it's really small, but they have it framed in a really big frame. And so the only thing in their entire lobby is a really sliver of an article framed from USA Today. And then as you draw closer to this article, you realize it's it's a ranking of Super Bowl ads in a very recent Super Bowl. And Five Hour Energy was voted the worst ad I didn't do that one, right? <laughs> you didn't do that one. Yeah. I didn't do that one. But it was voted the worst ad in the Super Bowl. And you're, and, and you're, and you're left wondering, why would Five Hour Energy have framed in their lobby the fact that they were voted the worst ad in the Super Bowl? Yep. And then you, realize, and then you realize there's a little brass plaque next to the frame that says, but our business went up astronomically. There's actually a percentage. I don't want to call it. <laughs> Which just goes to show you, even the worst advertiser in a Super Bowl can see very positive impact. <laughs> that's funny. That's funny. Yeah. yeah. And there's a lot, of, you know, I think that's a good place to close on because I know in the world I live in anyway, there's a real temptation to say, we don't have the money. It's not even worth trying. And you're right, the lobby still is terrible or the website hasn't been upgraded or is not mobile optimized or we haven't updated our graphic in a long time or we're phoning it in on social. And I think we could do a lot better. Well, Bill, this has been a delight. We'll all be watching the Super Bowl. I will be. And even as a Canadian, I know most of the audience for this podcast is American. They sub in Canadian ads. But thank goodness for YouTube and the internet because I will be watching the American ads. That's awesome. So well, it'll be you. fantastic. Thank you for all you're doing. This has been a delight. I barely got to any of my questions, which means we could do a round two at some point. <laughs> this is so helpful. And thanks for taking us behind the scenes. I really appreciate it, Bill. Hey, to follow you online or your work, where is a good spot for people to go on the internet? Um, I mean, you can go, you know, Haven, uh, mm-hmm. you know, so um, havenforcreative.com is where you can follow the agency. That's the agency that's producing the ads. Yeah. And then, you know, so that's my agency, but then I, 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 I do consult you know, and, and educate very inexpensively. I've, I, I, I've, you know, like my seminars, my webinars, my books and stuff, I got are all priced to be able to help the small and medium sized nonprofit organization, faith based organization. And so, um, you just look, do more good on any platform really. And, uh, and that's going to be me. Awesome. Awesome. Bill, can't thank you enough. Appreciate it. All right. Appreciate it. Thank you. There's a new movement happening in the country to reclaim the promise of Jesus' unconditional love and grace and to see his church rise above the culture war. He gets us, hopes to give it a voice. The biggest faith campaign in history, He Gets Us invites a rapidly growing audience from spiritual explorers to like-minded Christians to reconsider the radical life of Jesus. Whether people believe Jesus was God or just a man, they're invited to consider his example for themselves.